Yes, sir. I have a friend that at uh, work who is an audience Christian in the whole industry, the Bible is a charismatic, I'm really deep in the sun. And it sounds like nothing out of this world. It looks like it's nothing that anybody can do on their own to fake it. Where is it coming from? You say it looks like there's nothing anybody can do to fake it? All right, first Corinthians chapter, first Corinthians chapter 14 and first Corinthians chapter 1. Now it's amazing how much can be done to fake it. For example, I could stand here and I'll say to you, I could say, uh, Alika be samahal tatu masikit kubuntuk wagang magala manu kanaku kubru. And all I've done is talk Filipino to you. But a Filipino probably wouldn't get it because that's Pampangan dialogue and you got Ilocano and Venusayan and Tagalog and everything else. Well, none of these fellows, these charismatic fellows stopped in the street and they said, you got the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost talking in the tongues? And I said, sure. And I gave him, uh, Eath Shanayim Shalosha Barbe Misha Shisha Shibu Shimona. That's a bunch of Hebrew. And then just for a little bit of, I put, you know, canto no llores, porque cantando se le conocilito lindo a tu little Spanish at him. And then just to make sure I wound it up, I put vende alp and rose and vidra blue in his common heim suruk, I threw some German at him, see. And by the time I put German, Spanish, and Hebrew, Hebrew at him, he didn't know where he was at. And he said, well, you weren't in the spirit. And I said, the Bible said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, none of his. If I don't have the spirit, I'm lost. But I knew what he meant. He said, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I said, ah, oh, nuts. And I made up my mind, if anybody ever put that on me again, I'd, uh, I'd fool them. So the next time a charismatic asked me that, I said, do you talk in tongues? I said, yes, I do. And I put back my head and went in my act. See, I knew what he meant when he said in the spirit. He meant a Hollywood show. Yeah. That's what he meant. So I went on and said, I am so and this charismatic clapped her hand and said, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it. <laughs> I thought to myself, why well, you silly ass, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> All right, now, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, about the tongues. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Now, you want to mark that. You never a charismatic in your life, tell you that, what they're for. PTL pulling the leg went on for about eight years. And nobody that show ever told you what a sign were, uh, tongues were. They're for a sign. That's what it says. All right, now, 1 Corinthians one twenty two. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. Whoever demonstrated tongues in front of you forgot to ask you whether or not you were a Jew. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek wisdom. The signs are Jewish. And the Jews require a sign, and tongues a sign. Oh, I come to Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and notice the tongues are an apostolic sign because all the apostles are Jewish. Second Corinthians 12, 12. Second Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patient signs and wondrous and mighty deeds. So the signs are apostolic. And that's why you find them in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And those signs being apostolic are given to Jews because the Jews require a sign. Now come to Mark 16, notice how this thing is sewed up. So the only people who have tongues are either Jewish apostles or somebody led to Christ by a Jewish apostle. And once the Acts of the Apostle ceases, the signs cease. Mark 16:15. Mark 16, 15, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, there they go, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. There it goes. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hand to the sick, and they shall recover. So then hath the Lord has spoken to them, Jewish, circumcised, pork abstaining, Sabbath observing, temple worshiping Jews. Nobody he gave that to could eat pork. Peter didn't find out they were able to eat pork till Acts chapter 10. Nobody gave that thing to, went to a local church. There weren't any local churches, they went to the temple. Nobody gave that thing to, went to church Sunday morning. They were Jews, they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Verse 20, and they, 
the apostles, Jewish, went forth and preaching everywhere where the Lord working with them, the Jewish apostles, and confirming the word with signs following. See that? So the sign then lasts only as long as the apostles ministered Israel. And when God's through with Israel, then the sign cease. All right, come to Acts chapter 28 and notice when this thing is. This thing lasts as long as the apostles last. And the apostle last is over. Acts 28, Acts 28, 28. Uh, once in a while the Lord plays some strange thing in the Bible to show you uh, some markers and signposts. And of course the charismatics are not Bible students. There isn't a charismatic where in the United States knows enough Bible to teach a daily vacation Bible school. They don't, uh, they're ignorant, very ignorant people, very stupid people. And some of them are good people. Some of them are nice people. And they're sweet people and respectable people and wonderful Christians. <laughs> but they couldn't find a bowling ball in a bathtub <laughs> when it comes to finding the truth in the Word of God. And the reason why is they major in love and feelings. And they don't major in truth. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore to you the salvation of God is sent to who? Gentiles. And they will hear it. God ceases dealing with Israel in Acts 28. So the signs stop. Now do you know how you know those signs stop? Turn to 2 Timothy. It's absolutely certain you can't possibly miss it. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20. There's any question about it. Paul wrote 2 Timothy long after Acts 28. Many years after Acts 28, when Paul was about to be beheaded, he wrote these words. 2 Timothy 4.20 Arasus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum. What? Sick. What's the matter, Paul? Can't you heal him? How come he left him sick? Look at this one here. First Timothy, well, written right before he died, after Acts 28. First Timothy chapter, first Timothy chapter, uh, uh, three, or four, or five, make it five. Second Timothy five, verse 23. Why Paul could heal people by handkerchiefs taken from his body. How come he left one of his buddies sick? Paul could raise dead people. How come he couldn't heal his buddy? 1 Timothy 5.23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Recommended medicine, stomach medicine to Timothy. Why? Timothy is sick, and thine often infirmities. How come Paul couldn't heal him? Does the Bible say, they'll lay a hand on the sick and they shall recover? Why, Paul's healing people through the book of Acts right and left. One time he raised a dead man, and Timothy gets sick and he can't heal him, and Erastus gets Sick and Trophimus gets sick and he can't heal him. What's the trouble? The signs are gone. The signs are gone. The book of Acts is over. Now tell me the way you know that. You know that because if a man had the gift of healing, like these pastors say, what would he be doing with a with a healing tent? Or 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 Roberts with a dentist a, a, a medical school and a hospital. What's the hospital for? You say the sick, hey man, if you lay hand on the sick, you don't need a hospital. Amen. He he didn't say if you lay hand on the sick and they have faith to believe and only believe and send them an offering to release their faith, they might be healed. He said they'll lay hand on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. Now a man who has the apostolic signs doesn't have to counterfeit anything. A man with the apostolic signs can walk down the street and a shadow can heal people. Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 4. You don't have to worry about that. He might even lay hands on them. So they got the apostolic sign, and boy, they get they get saved when he walks by. <laughs> oh, Acts chapter Acts chapter five, verse fifteen. Acts five fifteen. I bet you never saw Copeland and Gorman and Roberts pull off that one. <laughs> Acts fakey, fakey, bunch of biggest fakes that ever lived. Amen. Bunch of them came to Pensacola one time, and I told one of them, I said, "When are you going to walk out there in the bay?" He said, what do you mean? I said, you told me that Christ said, because I go to the Father, works, you'll do a greater works than I do, you'll do because I go to the Father. And you believe that, don't you? Yes, well, he walked on the water. Let's see you walk on the water. 
You didn't find Catherine Coleman skating right out here in the bay in Seattle. She drowned. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, verse 15, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them in beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about to Jerusalem, bringing a sick folk to them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. No mistakes, no wet fuses, no short rounds. Every one was healed. So you find there's a big difference between charismatic Christianity and biblical Christianity. Matter of fact, it's so big that for eight years we called PTL pulling the leg. And when they finally found out, somebody found out Tammy was a dopehead and Jimmy was a fornicator, everybody said, oh, oh my God, how awful. And the rest of us said, oh my God, how normal. <laughs> I mean, there was no, it was no shock to any of us who knew the Bible. The only people who were shocked were people who had thrown the Bible out the window. And they, they began to call it, you know, pass the loot, you know, and pay the lady and all this and that, which is okay with me. I'm perfectly indifferent. Uh, I mean, PTO was never a ministry of any kind. Man, so I was telling a man one time about this. I forget where, somewhere. And I said, uh, would you tell me what it is about those people that people listen to them? He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm a grown man. I got seven children and ten grandchildren, and I've worked for a living all my life. And I said, even now, if I want to pick up some extra money, I do some painting or something. And I said, would you tell what? What would a grown man be doing listening to that stuff? I can't imagine it. I can't imagine that a man that hunted or fished turning on that stuff and listening to it for five minutes. <laughs> well, we hope that you will send in and get your Jesus Saves button and your square foot of Liberty Mountain there. That... <laughs> My God, what is that? I mean, I never, I never could figure any, if you took, if you took, if you took Fowell and Humbart and Roberts and Swindle and Schuler and Swaggart and MacArthur and Roberts, the whole bunch, and put them in one room, they couldn't keep me awake for five minutes. And I, and I, this fellow I was talking to said, well, you know what it is? And I said, well, what is it, man? Tell me. And he said, well, he said, the thing is, people, these days, they're cliff dwellers. They live in little condominiums. And he said, all this country, that audience, a bunch of people live in these little boxes. And you see, they work all day long, 40 hours a week, in the flap-folding department of a box-top factory someplace, and drink a quart of beer for lunch, and nobody talks to them all day long, and they fight traffic going to and from their home, and they get in a little box, and they want somebody to comfort them and make them feel good and pat them on the back because they're lonely and miserable, nobody knows them. They don't get any recognition, and he said they don't. They can't fix a garden. They don't have any garden. They can't mow the front yard. They're in any front yard. And he said they can't go hunting or fish, and they ain't a, a live wild animal or a fish within 20 miles where they live. So they get in these little boxes with this box in front of them, and they want somebody to pat them on the back and make them feel good. That's what he said. And I got thinking about that. I thought to myself, well, that must be it. There's no explanation for it. Talk about a ministry. I could get more excitement out of a leaky balloon. Honest to God, man. If I, if I had a chance, if I had a chance to hear Swindle, MacArthur, and Schuler on, and Swaggart, one program for an hour, with the organ and the specials and the songs, or go mullet fishing, I'd go mullet fishing every time. Amen. I'd even flip a coin. So what you got here is you got somebody here who's putting something on. Now, if you want to have to make it sound surreal, I'll give you some examples. At home where I am, one of my church members out in the backyard, and the pastor's wife of the charismatic church is walking up down her backyard with a sheet of paper, reading the paper. Hostile Shan Dantai Botai, Helder Gilly Fliberty Gibbet, reading this thing. And, and my, and my church member stops him and says, what are you doing? And this pastor's wife says, I'm practicing my tongues. And my church member said, you're practicing your tongues. And she said, yes, if you don't exercise your gift, you'll lose it. <laughs> oh, man, man, man. So some of them get pretty proficient at it. Up in Rochester, New York, I had a friend there, and one day a charismatic came there and talked to him, tried to get him to leave a Baptist church, and got on his knees, you know, and hostile, shandai, tie, bow tie, went through all the mess, you know. 
And when he got through, my friend said, uh, what's your scriptural authority for doing that? And he said, uh, Mark 16. And my friend went back in the back room in the cap cabinet and got a big bottle of ammonia and brought it back in and said, drink it, drink up. you see you drink that. And this guy said, oh, no, 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 that'd be tempting God. <laughs> and my friend said, the same passage that said, speak with new tongues, said they'll drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt them. And he said, yeah, that'd be tempting God. And I said, how do you know you're not tempting God if you don't know what you're saying? See, there's something to that. You know, years ago when I graduated from OCS, we had a fellow give us our final lesson in commands. And the idea behind a command is give your command clearly. And if there's one thing they emphasized was be clear, be clear, be clear. And if you wonder, I guess that had its mark on me. I guess, I guess I never got over it. The fellow said, I don't care if you even give a wrong command, give it plain. <laughs> so I have taught plain ever since. But when you give a command, you have to breathe out to, to, to project it. It has to be from the diaphragm. That's why when these fellows command, they don't count, they don't, when they count cadence, they don't count one, two, three, four, because you can't project. They count hip, hook, hip, begin the H, see? It's ho, it's that. A right flank, harsh. See, it's an, if you, when you breathe that thing out to project it, you have to blow, so you put H, see? Right shoulder, arms. You don't say right shoulder, arms. <laughs> you say right shoulder, Horns. And the, of course, the Marine, they talk in tongues, man. You know. And we had a fella, we had a fella, we had a fella in our battalion in Fort Leavenworth that he had that command of execution, whoop, down to where he'd cough. Funny thing you heard in your, ever heard in your life. Forward, <coughs> you know. And, and, and we'd have the parade, you know, your first battalion up here in your right go, Oh, present horns. And front of you, present horns. Third battalion, present horns. On down the road, fourth battalion, this guy down here and go, I mean, crack the troops up almost every time. Present. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and the day we graduated from OCS, that fellow got up and lined us all up there. I think we were, I think we were at attention. And then he said, hut, correct, horn. And you know, some came to inspection arms, some adjusted the slings, some of them fell out, a couple of them came to parade rest. Looked like ducks in a pond dodging lightning, you know. And, and after that thing was over, he told us what he'd said. What he said was Montgomery Ward. Montgomery <laughs> Ward, you know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> now, when a man, when a man talks in tongue, the Bible said, if a man given unto certain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? The fellow did that in front of you, he didn't edify anybody. Right. It didn't help anything. Baloney. <laughs> Ten cents a pound. <clears throat> All right, something else. Now, it's like a Bible to clear up a college education.